Today, I'm delighted that we have a Scottish perspective on the design and redesign of urban squares. And I'm particularly interested in the Scottish thing. I think it really has a, a big connection with Ireland, uh, similar independence of mind and spirit, uh, similar way of maybe being argumentative with each other. Um, but also, I think what Scotland has done in the last number of years is they focus on certain things and have begun to develop them. And we would hope in OPW to develop closer links with our colleagues in Scotland. And I'll be talking to Chris later about that. And I've already spoken to the architect in the state architect in Scotland to move that along. But we have Chris Dingwall, who's a landscape historian and heritage consultant. He has an MA from the York Institute of Advanced Studies, and many of us in OPW would know that Institute of Advanced Studies with fondness. He graduated in uh, 1989, and he's now going to give us his perspective on design and redesign of urban squares. So I'd ask to ask Chris come forward and do his talk. Uh, very good morning. Uh, it's an honour for me to have been invited to come and address this uh, meeting uh, and to offer, as the Chairman has said, a Scottish angle on the subject of Georgian squares. I should start by saying that my perspective on the subject is that of a garden historian uh, interested in perhaps the original design and purpose of these urban squares uh, but also in the changes which they have undergone in the last uh, 200 years or so. And in the time that I have available to me this morning, uh, I should like to concentrate on the stories of four principal squares in Scotland, uh, three of them in Edinburgh uh, and one in Glasgow. That's with the odd aside uh, thrown in. My story will begin in Edinburgh which uh, you see here in uh, an aerial view looking from the southeast, in which the old town, uh, that's this part, uh, can be seen uh, strung out along the ridge running down eastward from Edinburgh Castle uh, in the centre of the picture. Uh, first, I shall describe George Square uh, by the meadows to the south of the old town before going on to talk uh, about St. Andrew Square uh, and Charlotte Square, which stand at opposite ends of George Street in Edinburgh's first new town, which was developed between 1770 uh, and the end of the 18th century on what used to be known as Barefords Parks to the north of the old town. Uh, George Square, originally known as George's Square, uh, was a speculative development by the local architect and builder James Brown, named not after the reigning monarch, as you might think, uh, but after Brown's elder brother, George, uh, uh, begun in 1766. Uh, this was a year before the plan for Edinburgh's new town was unveiled, so the earliest uh, development of its kind, really, in, uh, in the city. And uh, George Square offered Edinburgh's wealthier citizens comfortable, uh, perhaps if architecturally unremarkable, houses. Uh, uh, jo uh, James Brown was as much a builder as, a, a, as an architect, but it offered them uh, accommodation well away from the noise and dirt uh, of the old town. Uh, next to the Meadows, or Hope Park, uh, which you see just uh, adjacent. Uh, uh, and the Hope Park, a former marshland, which had actually originally supplied Edinburgh with its water supply, but which had been drained and planted in the early 18th century, and which had become uh, by then the fashionable place for Edinburgh citizens to take a, a promenade. The square was laid out and planted as a private, though communal, pleasure ground for the keyholders from the surrounding houses, with a planting scheme uh, comprising an encircling belt of trees and a peripheral path, uh, together with cross paths meeting in uh, a central roundel, uh, elements which are well seen on a series of maps, uh, which I've put up there uh, starting earlier in the century, 1821, uh, the uh, 
and up to the uh, second edition Ordnance Survey uh, of 1893. So the character of the park really uh, maintained, changed very little in, in that period. The character of both the houses and the planting, we get an idea of that uh, in this view of the square uh, made towards the end of the 19th century, by which time the new town, Edinburgh's new town, had taken over as the most fashionable part of town. And although Brown's houses lacked architectural pretension, George Square retained its character throughout the 19th century and indeed on into the 20th century with very few changes. However, its close proximity to the University of Edinburgh saw properties around the square progressively acquired by the university uh, during the 20th century. And in spite of uh, very strenuous opposition from the Architectural Heritage Society of Scotland, and the Coburn Association, which many of you will know, I'm sure, is the uh, Civic Trust, Edinburgh's Civic Trust. The square was redeveloped by the university in the 1960s, with most of the Georgian terraces uh, replaced by typically functional architecture of the period. What I find quite interesting uh, now is uh, that following a review of listing, uh, by Historic Scotland in 2006, most of the 1960s buildings uh, by respectable architects like Basil Spence and, and so on are now listed uh, category A or category B. Now, amidst all this redevelopment and in spite of it having no protection in law, uh, the inner part of the square still uh, through all of this, retained its integrity uh, and does to this day. Technically speaking, George Square is still a private garden, a uh, keyholder's garden, if you like, for, uh, but with the university as the principal keyholder, uh, though in practice it is open to the public as well as to students on a daily basis. Uh, that said, if you go to the square today, you will see little signs as you enter the garden by the gates. And these signs assert the university's right uh, to close the gates should they wish to do so. So the, making the point that it is, in effect, still a private garden. Uh, for much of the year, George Square serves as a mature green space, more or less at the heart of the university as part of its campus, if you like, uh, uh, though for a month or two every summer, it becomes one of numerous venues uh, for events which form part of Edinburgh's festival fringe. And so, uh, moving on to Edinburgh's new town, uh, and uh, to explain a little bit about that, it's laid out on a, a low ridge uh, here, the Barefoots Parks, as, uh, as was, uh, flanked to the south by Princes Street Gardens on the right of the picture uh, and to the north by Queen Street Gardens. Uh, Princes Street Gardens now a public open space, Queen Street Gardens uh, uh, private uh, gardens still. And George Street serves as a spine or the backbone of the, uh, of the scheme linking St Andrew's Square uh, to the east, top of the picture, uh, to Charlotte Square uh, in the west, the bottom of the picture. The Edinburgh Newtown plan devised by otherwise little known architect uh, James Craig, uh, who died incidentally before his scheme was finished, uh, saw development take place over around 25 years, uh, working gradually from St Andrew's Square uh, westwards uh, towards uh, Charlotte Square. So what of St Andrew's Square? Uh, this was originally laid out as an open lawn uh, surrounded by a narrow belt of trees as seen on Robert Kirkwood's map uh, of 1817. Uh, but the character of the layout of the square soon became a subject for public debate especially following the erection of the Melville Monument in 1823, 
commemorating the prominent uh, Scottish politician Henry Dundas of uh, Viscount uh, Melville. Uh, supposedly imitating Trajan's column in Rome. This was built, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, by the lighthouse architect Robert Stevenson, Scottish uh, lighthouse architect. And soon after this, new designs for the square were drawn up uh, by the then curator of the Edinburgh Botanic Garden, uh, William McNabb. Uh, among them, which you see uh, here on the right here. Uh, one was for a paved uh, Italian piazza, French place, if you like, uh, such as Desmond was describing earlier. Uh, another for perhaps a more elaborate planting scheme with a series of crisscrossing uh, paths, uh, which you see down uh, in the right-hand corner of the slide there. In the event, the planting of what became a railed off space uh, involved a series of winding paths running through trees and shrubberies planted around a central lawn, as seen on this Ordnance Survey map uh, of 1851. Uh, and also in this near contemporary detail from a, a watercolour view by uh, the Edinburgh painter uh, Joseph Ebsworth. Uh, as a view seen from the top of the monument to Sir Walter Scott, which is nearby uh, in Prince's Street Gardens. And I'm struck there by the similarity, in a way, of the, de of the design, perhaps on a smaller scale, uh, to that for Mountjoy uh, Square, uh, which uh, Merlo was uh, describing earlier, or showed uh, slides of earlier. Pictures from uh, the 19th and even from the early 20th century show the square at different stages in its evolution uh, and seemingly in reasonable order. However, uh, as a private or keyholder's garden uh, surrounded by offices and institutions, uh, it had become increasingly neglected and run down by the end of the 20th century. I'm intrigued to see uh, in the late, oh, sorry, early 20th century view here, uh, back to laid out with tennis courts uh, and the like, uh, but still a, a private garden. But uh, that is no longer the case because the, the neglect, the perceived neglect of the square has led to an arrangement uh, which has seen the square leased from the surrounding property uh, keyholders, if you like, by Edinburgh City Council for 50 years, just a recent uh, development. And it, uh, with that as the driver, it was remodeled by uh, landscape architect Gillespie's uh, in 2008 and turned uh, into a public open space, effectively, overseen and managed by Essential Edinburgh, uh, which is a local business consortium uh, and uh, now forms part of Edinburgh's Business Improvement District, uh, something which I, I think uh, you also have here uh, in the centre uh, of Dublin. Uh, this is a, a perspective view of the new uh, layout as devised by uh, Gillespie's. And you'll see here cafe, sort of central area, but uh, a modern design imposed uh, on uh, the old square, but retaining uh, a good deal of the original planting, uh, but clearly qu quite a, a radical development. And the remodeled square now boasts a cafe, as well as serving as a venue for exhibitions, uh, corporate events, uh, and the like. Uh, not to mention uh, acting as a shortcut from Princes Street to uh, new branch of Harvey Nichols uh, in the northeast corner of the square. Uh, the current uh, development going on in that square is the termination of the ill-fated or uh, sort of a, a tram development in Edinburgh where they're creating a terminus along one side of the square. So constant change in order to accommodate these new uh, uh, developments. So that's St. Andrew's Square. 
Uh, and so on to Charlotte Square, a quarter of a mile or so to the west, for which a number of plans were drawn up in the 1780s uh, and the 1790s. Uh, here you see uh, a couple of them for octagonal uh, squares. Uh, although it actually took until 1808 before the uh, key holders finally agreed on a planting scheme, uh, by which time they got rather fed up with the sort of wasteland that it, it had been. Uh, and the scheme that was put in place, in fact, was a circular one, uh, as again seen on Robert Kirkwood's plan of 1817. Surely the grandest of Edinburgh's squares, Charlotte Square, is famous uh, for being graced by the architecture of Robert Adam, uh, the architect Robert Adam. Though, like James Craig before him uh, and his new town, Adam uh, did not live to see his design uh, completed. The late 18th century view, similar to that of the early one that I showed of George Square, shows Charlotte Square uh, by then remodeled as an octagon uh, with a mixed plantation of trees, uh, laburnums, sycamores, limes, birches, elms, a uh, sort of fairly typical uh, mixture uh, together with some shrubs. Although a private, that uh, is a, a keyholder's garden, if you like, uh, like the others, Charlotte Square was subsequently chosen as the site of a memorial uh, to Prince Albert, erected in 1875 uh, as a public monument uh, to which access was arranged uh, by a railed corridor and a, a railed enclosure, which you see uh, in this uh, picture here. And indeed, on the Ordnance Survey town plan, uh, though interestingly, uh, the privilege of public access to Albert's uh, monument was eventually withdrawn uh, when the railings were replaced following their removal during the Second World War. So he's now in the middle of a, a private square. After the war, the management committee, uh, uh, formed of the local uh, surrounding residents, if you like, or uh, key holders, uh, in discussion with the Edinburgh Town Council, uh, had considered a proposal by uh, an architect, landscape architect, Leslie Graham Thompson, to remodel the square uh, as a public open space alongside another, even more radical plan uh, to create an underground car park uh, on the site of the square, uh, neither of which proposals was ever uh, adopted. And instead, the railings were reinstated, as I mentioned, right around the square, uh, cutting off access to the Albert Memorial. So uh, Charlotte Square remains, like Fitzwilliam, uh, here in Dublin, uh, Fitzwilliam Square, uh, still a private keyholder's garden, mostly used by office workers, uh, given that the surrounding properties are uh, mostly businesses, uh, uh, but used at sort of lunchtime uh, by office workers. Uh, I understand also that keys uh, to the square can be obtained by other local residents, uh, not, holding, not necessarily holding property on the square, uh, for the payment of a modest fee, which does go uh, towards, obviously, the expenses of, of management. That said, there is public access to the garden for a short period every summer during the Edinburgh International Festival, when Charlotte Square uh, plays host uh, to the uh, Edinburgh's annual book festival, which has just celebrated its 30th year. Uh, well, this might seem like a good arrangement, uh, it's not without its problems, amongst which is the damage done to the grass by the marquees, uh, by thousands of feet, especially in west, wet weather, and more seriously perhaps the compaction of the soil, uh, which has led to severe drainage problems. And so, finally, and swiftly, on to Glasgow, where I shall say just a few words about George Square, 
uh, conceived as part of the so-called merchant city, which developed uh, alongside the medieval town from the 1750s onwards. Glasgow's George Square uh, first formed in 1781, but spent some years as a muddy hollow and a knacker's yard uh, before being laid out in the 19th century uh, as a civic space overlooked by the, uh, at first by townhouses and latterly by the city chambers, which you see uh, here. Uh, time will not allow me to say much about the evolution of this important part of Glasgow's townscape or to relate its recent history, uh, which has resulted in the loss of much of the greenery uh, seen uh, in earlier uh, plans and maps and the introduction several years ago of some loathsome uh, red tarmac, uh, which you see here. Uh, everybody agrees that it's really a bit of a shame, this great civic space. Uh, poor condition of the square led the city council to commission designs for a major revamp prompted by Glasgow's selection uh, as the venue for the 2014 Commonwealth Games. And given Glasgow's ambition, along with Dublin, as I understand, to be considered for the award as European uh, Green Capital, uh, the six designs put forward for consideration uh, in a competition were met with almost universal derision by uh, Glasgow citizens. Uh, almost all the designs uh, involving a further reduction uh, of the green space. And given Glasgow's notoriously wet weather, one of the designs which proposed to fill the square with fountains seemed, <laughs> seemed particularly perverse. Such was the adverse public reaction that the plans have been shelved uh, in favour, maybe, uh, of a less costly scheme uh, involving the reinstatement of elements of the original design, re perhaps reinstating some of the green space. Uh, perhaps the wackiest of the designs was that for some tartan tarmac, <laughs> a proposal which led one wag to put forward a modification of this idea, uh, which would have seen a division of the square between the traditional colours of Glasgow Rangers <laughs> uh, and Glasgow Celtic. All of which brings me, as you will be glad to know, Chairman, to my last slide, uh, which... Uh, is probably the saddest of uh, Scotland's Georgian squares, namely Golden Square uh, in Aberdeen, uh, which was laid out between 1810 and 1821. This small but once handsome little civic space uh, near the heart of the commercial centre of Aberdeen uh, has been sacrificed, as you'll see in the, on the picture on the right, uh, to the motor car and now serves as little more than a glorified car park. So, is there anything to be learned from the stories of these four Scottish squares, uh, I wonder? If so, perhaps it is uh, that uh, all of them can be seen to have changed, whether substantially or subtly, uh, in form and function over time in response to changing social and economic circumstances while continuing to serve as open spaces, green spaces uh, within the city. That they are cherished as such, indeed uh, Charlotte and uh, St Andrew's Square form part of what is now Edinburgh's World Heritage Site, the, uh, the city. Uh, one thing there can be no doubt, that is that the citizens of Edinburgh and Glasgow feel passionately about them uh, and have shown themselves ready to defend uh, these spaces against what they see as inappropriate, uh, particularly commercial uh, development. Thank you very much.